So good morning, everyone. So today we have the pleasure to to receive Francesco La Barbera from the Naples Observatory. And so Francesco, a, a little bit of background of him. He he got his PhD from the University of Naples, Federico II, working on galaxy evolution in intermediate redshift clusters. And then he he was a postdoc at INF for a few years and right after that he, he was absorbed, he, he got a position uh, at the observatory uh, of Naples since 2004. And so Francesco works on stellar population and structural properties of early type galaxies and galaxies in general, scaling relations, the effect of environment on galaxy evolution. He's also a member of the KIDS and also the STEP surveys. And he is a great expert on, on the study of the stellar IMF in unresolved stellar populations, and that's what he is going to talk about today. Mm. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Of course, uh, I would like to thank Florent and also Paulo for giving me this nice opportunity to have this talk here today. And as Paolo was mentioning, I will tell you today about our work on the stellar initial mass function in early type galaxies. This is a project that we started a number of years ago in 2013, actually. And we have been doing this kind of analysis using different data sets, Sloan data in here, uh, data from GTC U series, and more recently with the Muse and also Xshooter, and Khalifa data as well as I will tell you during my talk today. Okay, so let's start from a very basic definition. The, everybody knows, I mean, that the stellar IMF is the mass distribution of stars collectively born in one single event of star formation. You can see some nice pictures here. And of course, this is a fundamental, very important ingredient of astrophysics for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them are listed here. It governs the matter cycle of galaxies, so how the gas is being transformed into stars. It sets the mass scale of galaxies through the stellar mass to light ratio. It enters the conversion of typical diagnostics of star formation, drives the energy feedback into the stellar medium, and of course is important by itself for any theory of star formation. Okay, so it's a crucial ingredient of astrophysics. So this is a picture just to give you, to provide you with some of the basic definitions that I will use during the talk. So in such a way that we understand each other. Okay, this is the a plot of log number of stars uh, as a function of the mass of stars in logarithmic scale. So this is the IMF. A single power law is uh, just a line in here. And as you can see, this orange solid line is the Salpeter unimodal what we say unimodal IMF, which is in here. When you increase the slope of this power law, you get a more bottom-heavy distribution, so a steeper function with an enhanced fraction of low mass stars. This is what we call a bottom-heavier IMF. But there are different kind of functional forms. For most of the nearby stellar associations, the IMF seems to be consistent with, with the Krupa-like distribution, which is plotted as dashed red uh, curve in here. So it is a Salpeter slope at the masses above 0.5 solar mass, and then it's flatter at lower masses. The low mass tapered by model IMF, defined by Vazdekis uh, at all in a couple of papers, is a generalization of this Krupa-like distribution, where you change the slope of the IMF as well, but you keep it flattened, uh, flat at low masses here, okay? So you can change this slope from 1.3, where you essentially get the group alike IMF, to higher gamma, which is the black dashed line. Once again, you see an enhanced fraction of low mass stars, but not such very low mass stars as in the single power law IMF. So this is just some definitions. Single power law by modal IMF. I will keep you know, mentioning this during the talk. So let's just keep in mind, you know, this kind of definition. Increasing the slope, we increase the fraction of low with respect to high mass stars, so a more bottom-heavy distribution. And of course, I will tell you about early-type galaxies at redshift zero, 
which means that we are talking about old stellar populations for which all the light that we actually observe comes from stars which are below one solar masses, actually slightly below that. So when I talk about constraints on the IMF of low redshift early type galaxies, I'm, I'm actually talking about this segment here, okay? The more massive stars are already gone for an old population. This is something that we also have to keep in mind. Okay, just a short introduction about what the gravity sensitive features are and how we use them to constrain the stellar IMF. So in nearby stellar associations, actually we can count the stars directly and we can infer in a more direct way the IMF that seems to be consistent uh, with the Krupa-like universal distribution. When we go to distant galaxies, we cannot count the individual stars, so we have to rely on indirect methods. And one of them, the most powerful one perhaps, is provided by the gravity sensitive features. I will tell you in a while what they are. So just a little bit of introduction about stellar population models. So we observe the integrated light coming from the galaxies. So we don't count any individual stars. So we have to compare the spectra of galaxies to models in order to infer the IMF and other stellar population parameters. This is done through stellar population models. Essentially, this is the IMF, number of stars per unit mass. This is a spectrum of a star with mass m, given age and chemical composition. And then through this integral, you get your simple stellar population model prediction, your model spectrum. Of course, you can also convolve this one by the star formation history of the galaxy, and then you get the composite stellar population model. And as you can see, this model spectra, which is something that people at this point have been doing for decades, depend on chemical composition, age, and number of parameters, including the IMF. So, in principle, comparing the model spectra to the observation, you can infer the, the parameters, including the IMF. So this, can, this is done nowadays in two different ways. One is a spectral fitting. You compare model and uh, observed spectra in the lambda space, wavelength range. And this is an example of what you get. This is uh, the black one is, a, is an observed spectrum for M32. And you can see the best fitting spectrum from the library of Bazidekis et al, which is overplotted in green. You can see the amazing matching that uh, uh, you're getting, at least in this case. Another method is that of using the line strength, the equivalent width. I mean, for the absorption spectrum, uh, for the absorption features in the spectrum, you measure the line strength, which is essentially the, the area subtended by the features with respect to two flanking regions, which are named pseudo continua. This is an example for the H and K calcium doublet at 3900 angstrom. Here you have the pseudo continua, and then you measure the line strength of the feature. And of course, you can compare models and observations in the space of the line strengths by selecting a well-established you know, set of, 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 uh, of features. This is something that might be familiar to, to a number of people here, maybe. Uh, this is essentially an illustration of this kind of approach for two indicators, H-beta, magnesium iron prime, which is a combination of magnesium and iron lines in the optical. And uh, you can see this is observed the stacked spectra from Sloan, increasing mass from 100 to 300 km per second velocity dispersion. And on top of it, you can see a grid of simple stellar population model predictions with varying age. H beta gets uh, shallower and increasing metallicity from here to here. From the position of the, sp of the observations on the grid, you can infer age metallicity. And possibly, with other features, you can also infer your IMF slope. And this is what uh, can be done in principle using the gravity sensitive features. This is a simple idea after all, and that's why it was already applied in the 80s, uh, even before than that. So and the idea is uh, illustrated here. These are spectra for stars, okay? You have a K giant, an M giant, an M dwarf. So these and these have same temperature, but different gravity, different mass. So as you can see, there are features in the spectrum like this sodium 8200, uh, feature which are prominent in the spectrum of a dwarf star, but they are essentially absent uh, in the spectrum of a giant star. And the opposite applies to the calcium triplet, which is uh, prominent in the spectra of giant stars, but it's barely seen in the spectra of dwarfs. 
So now, if you have your stacked spectrum of Virgo galaxies, as it was done in this paper by Van Dokum and Corroy 2010, this is a black spectrum, you compare to simple cell population model predictions with different IMF, Krupa 1 is magenta, you see the feature is stronger, and then it's more consistent with the bottom heavier IMF. So, an enhanced fraction of Loma stars in your IMF compared to the Krupa-like distribution. So, uh, as I said before, this is an old idea, after all, but at the beginning it was plugged by a number of issues. That's why the studies in the 80s were quite inconclusive. It was revamped first in Scenario et al. 2003, and then in Van Dokum and Koroi paper 2010. So, it gives the impression that this is simple, right? You measure li your line strengths, you compare two models, and then you infer your IMF. But, I mean, the situation is far less simple than how it can look like. First of all, I don't know if you noticed, but in the previous plot, but the effect, this is the sodium 8200 IMF sensitive feature. The effect of varying the IMF is a few percent, okay? The blue one is a typical spectrum for an early type galaxy, massive galaxy nearby. So you can see that the sodium 8200 feature falls right on top of this strong absorption from telluric lines, which is at the level of 20%. And you're trying to appreciate an effect which is at a few percent level. Of course, you don't have perfect stellar population models, but they also have their own uncertainties. This is, for instance, the isochrons, uh, which are, let's say, one of the crucial ingredients of any stellar population models. Same age, same chemical composition, but different kind of groups, you know, making this isochron. And you can see differences in temperature for giants, but also for dwarfs at a level of few hundred K. So it can, it can give the impression that this is negligible, but it's not for the, uh, the IMF business. This is the tier two feature, which is also sensitive to IMF. The variation from saltpeter to bottom heavy, which is in red, is pretty really much the same as the variation due to a shift in the temperature of giants by 200 K, which is the red spectrum here. So the problem is degenerate with possible systematics or uncertainties in your stellar population model predictions. If you're not depressed enough, there is a further issue, which is that of abundance ratios. This is a calcium triplet going from Krupa-like to bottom heavy in red. If you decrease calcium abundance, but you keep your IMF fixed to Krupa, you get essentially the same kind of spectrum as in the bottom heavy case. So it's also degenerate with abundance ratios. Well, of course, there are good news, and that's why also I'm here today. Uh, you can break this kind of degeneracies by combining different features from different chemical species and more important perhaps in different wavelength ranges. The effect of temperature is lambda dependent, it becomes mostly negligible in the red. The effect of abundance ratios, calcium will affect the calcium features but not for instance the tile feature and so on and so far. So as I say, Combining different features in different spectral range, you can actually get rid of these kind of issues. But of course, you have to get extremely high quality data. Um, and that's what we, we started with, actually, in order to derive the IMF slope in early type galaxies. I will tell you about results we got so far in terms of dependence on mass, radius inside galaxies, and also the environment where the galaxies reside. And then I will tell you about some ongoing, more recent stuff with the X-Shooter. Okay, this is a, the group of people that we have been collaborating over the last five years or so. Uh, it was at the beginning me, Ignacio Ferreras at UCL, and Alejandro Vazdekis at IAC. And this is another the group of people involved so far. Okay, everything started from the Sloan data in 2003, in these two papers. We selected, it was simple, uh, we had a well-selected sample of early type galaxies from Sloan, stuck the spectra according to velocity dispersion from 100 to 300 and something, kilometer per second velocity dispersion, and we compared with model predictions from Vazdek is a tool, stellar population models with varying age, metallicity, and of course IMF. We stack the spectra extremely carefully, getting very high signal to noise ratio. This is what we are talking about for the stack the spectra. And we did also a very careful job in terms of removing any kind of sky contamination in the spectra. Well, this is a couple of plots from the paper. It's quite massive, but I will try to 
focus our attention on a couple of things. So these panels plot all different IMF sensitive features, Tio, sodium, and so on and so far, both in the opticals and the near infrared wavelength, uh, wave as a function of the metallicity, uh, total metallicity indicator magnesium iron prime. These are the observations, the sequence with mass of early type galaxies from here to here. And these grids are model predictions with varying metallicity, subsolar to supersolar, and varying IMF. Group alike is here, and bottom heavy is here. And these are different best fitting models that we obtain, assuming different star formation histories. And then you can see you get this very nice sequence going from essentially group alike in here to bottom heavy for the most massive guys in our sample. You require both age, metallicity, and IMF slope vary with mass. This is for single power law models, as I was saying uh, at the beginning. I mean, this is just power law down to very low uh, stellar masses. And we did the same for the bimodal IMF, getting pretty much the same kind of result. And of course, at the same time, we didn't only fit the uh, IMF sensitive features, but also the Barman line, getting such a very nice you know, agreement with observations in order to make sure that the ages of our systems are correctly matched. And this is two different renditions of the same result. Essentially, you, uh, you get this nice trend of IMF, either unimodal or bimodal, with the velocity dispersion in galaxies, group alike is here, and then you get bottom heavy at very high masses. It doesn't matter what you change in the modeling, one SSP, two SSP, you plug in the effect of different abundance ratios and so on and so far, the trend is always in place. Okay, this is the main message that I would like to, to convey here. So it can look like, uh, you can get an impression that this distinction about unimodal and bimodal is just, you know, a definition, but it's a crucial one because the very low mass stars are the ones that dominate the mass budget in a stellar population, although they give a very little contribution to the integrated light. And that's why, although you fit in the observation so well in both the cases, but you get very different mass to light ratios. In the bimodal IMF, you get something which is below 10, while you can get up to 30 or even more with a unimodal distribution. So, but in either case, in both cases, you fit your IMF sensitive features extremely well, which means that you, we are not really in place to constrain the stellar mass to light ratio so well with this kind of approach. Okay, so this was for the integrated uh, uh, spectra or in the slow and aperture that covers, let's say, a given fraction of the effective radius for each galaxy, something like half, a bit more of the effective radius. So the next step we did was to ask ourselves, I mean, to study where this bottom heavy population is actually located inside galaxies. And this was the next step. And this is what we did with Nacho Martin Navarro, who was at that time in 2015 a PhD student there at the IAC. So these are the two papers. In this paper, we observed these two galaxies. One is a massive guy, the other one is more, let's say, less massive, uh, 100 kilometers per second velocity dispersion with those series uh, at the GTC for a number of hours in order, in order to get extremely high quality spectra with a few hundred signal to noise per angstrom. And this is the IMF inference as a function of position within the galaxies, okay? So it's not the integrated information, the global information from, so that we got from Sloan, but here it's a different position. And you can see that it gets higher, gamma, the slope gets higher, so more bottom heavy in the center for the more massive galaxies. And then it drops down to almost Krupa-like, which is here in the outer part at around, let's say, one effective radius. While for the less massive galaxies, you don't have much of radial variation and you also don't see a bottom heavy distribution in the center. At the same time, we studied these nearby galaxies, the NGC 1277 from through here till 2014. This is a very interesting system because it is believed to be one of the few uh, relics galaxies that we have at Regis Zero, one, let's say, counterpart of the massive red nuggets that we, compact red, red nuggets that we observe at high redshift. So in this kind of galaxies, although the massive system, we didn't see much of a variation with the radius and almost a, a pretty much bottom heavy everywhere in the galaxy. So at that time, we were very happy about this, uh, this result because it fits a two-phase formation scenario 
where you have, let's say, the formation of a compact core with the bottom heavy IMF at high redshift. Then you keep accreting in the outer part a more, let's say, krupa like material for lower mass galaxies in the outer part. And then you come up with a nice IMF gradient in a massive system nearby, like this one. Okay, this was only for two galaxies, so we went a step ahead with the Khalifa sample in Martina Varro et al. 2015. Uh, considering a sample of 24 ETGs from Khalifa, this is a nice snapshot. So, in this case, we asked ourselves what is the best correlator actually with the IMF slope? Okay, because this is a natural question. I mean, what is driving these IMF variations? Uh, within galaxies, is it the mass of a galaxy, is it the radius, or, or what? So in here we derived the IMF locally in this sample of galaxies and plotted it as a function of different quantity. No much correlation with the local velocity dispersion in this case. A little bit of correlation with magnesium over phi. The most convincing correlation is actually the one with the metallicity here from supersolar to supersolar. You can see this nice correlation. And if you ever plot our slow and stack spectral result, you also see that they follow this kind of relation. So, so far seems to be, it seems that actually total metallicity is the best correlator to IMF slope. It doesn't mean that metallicity is actually the driver of IMF variation but uh, it is the main uh, correlator. So whatever is causing metallicity to vary is probably related to IMF as well. Okay, this is uh, mo some more recent work with the Muse. This is a beautiful data with Mark Sarsi actually for M87 from the science verification phase. Uh, you can see this cube Muse for M87. Mark did a very careful job to mask out all regions possibly affected by any kind of emission, contamination by skylines, and so on and so far. At the end, we remain with these Voronoi bins, and we apply the same techniques into spectra in each single bin. And once again, I mean, changing all possible, changing a number of the ingredients in the analysis, we always came up with the same result with an IMF gradient from bottom heavy to less bottom heavy in the outer part of the galaxy. Okay, this is in terms of mass to light ratio, and this is also some recent result from Van Dokkum et al. 2017, where they also found a uh, nice agreement with our IMF uh, gradients. Well, we also pushed ourselves, let's say, to the opposite extreme of galaxy mass. This is a, a dwarf galaxy that we studied with Jacob in 2016. This is a 10 to 9 point something solar masses. So we did pretty much the same. This is a Muse uh, mosaic with two different pointings. In this case, we derived the IMF at different positions within the galaxy. You can see Krupa like is here, bottom heavy is here. All possible solutions are in this part of the diagram. So you infer this same technique applied to very low mass galaxies gives either a top heavy or a Krupa like distribution. So it nicely, let's say, continues uh, the Sluan trend to lower masses. This is some more recent work in terms of the environment where galaxies reside. We stack the spectra uh, according to the environment, splitting them into uh, splitting galaxies into centrals and satellites. This is the IMF sigma relation from Sloan. You see no much variation actually with the, between the two uh, samples. The same for satellites in a low and a high mass groups. And the same for central split at once again according to the parent halo mass. No much variation with the environment. And we also tested a number of ingredients, as usual in the modeling, founding pretty much the same result. This is a Rosani et al. Uh, paper from essentially last this year. Okay, let me just tell you something about what is going on right now with this shooter. It is, in my view, very exciting stuff. So we collected spectra, new long street spectroscopy with the X shooter at BLT. This is a, a small sample of seven nearby galaxies, but it's a very special sample. All of them have high mass, more than 300 kilometers per second velocity dispersion, so mass is fixed. But these galaxies cover a wide range of abundance ratios, like, for instance, magnesium over phi. And this is, of course, one of the aspects that you want to address if there is any unknown, let's say, degeneracy with abundance ratios that you're not properly taking into account in the analysis. 
And the beauty of this instrument is that uh, it has three arms, UV, Vis and near infrared. So in just one single shot, essentially you can get a spectrum that goes from uh, 3000 something up to throughout the K band. Okay? So you have everything. And as I said before, as I was pointing out, this is crucial in order to break the degeneracies. The slit size is such that essentially we can uh, observe each galaxy out to plus minus one effective radius. Uh, resolution is uh, amazing, more than 5,000, which means that you can do an extremely good job in order to remove the sky contamination, both emissions and telluric absorptions. And we integrated five hours per galaxy. Okay, these are nearby galaxy, which means that we have this kind of signal to noise ratio in the galaxy central regions, and we still have 100 uh, out to almost one effective radius. These are two examples of the two of the galaxies we observed. Uh, these figures here show the subtraction of best fitting search models. We also have kinematics along different position angles. And this is some examples of the spectra that you get. This is. Uh, the snapshots for all the seven galaxies. And this is, these are the spectra after, you know, long sufferance, let's say, to reduce the data, putting them together, and so on and so far. This is the central region in red, and then we move outwards when we get bluer, out to almost one effective radius. As I told you before, you have essentially all possible features from the UV throughout the K-band. All right, and of course, this is the kind of work that you can do with the telluric lines, for instance, to remove them. Uh, because of the high resolution, essentially, you can uh, appreciate each single line. Most of them are not that blended, so you can really do an incredible job removing them at sub percent level accuracy. Okay, so here I just wanted to, to put this plot that I think summarizes one of the most important results from, from this paper. Once again, in terms of IMF radial variations in galaxies, this is La Barbeto 2016. So we focus on TIO features. So in the optical, you have this TIO2 uh, indicator that is sensitive to IMF. As you can see, this, these are model predictions, okay? Uh, Krupa-like is here, the model prediction. Bottom heavy is here, okay? You can, because of the large wavelength range provided by X shooter, you can also measure this feature, TIO feature as well, in the near infrared at 8900 angstrom. And this is what I told you before, that you can break the genesis because this feature here is not sensitive to IMF. See, there is, uh, when you go to bottom heavy, there is no variation. While it is extremely sensitive to abundance ratios, like the fraction of alpha elements and also individually titanium and oxygen. So you get a nice, uh, nice combination of indices where abundance ratios go vertically in the models and IMF goes horizontally. And this is what we get from the observations going from the central region of the galaxy outwards to one effective radius. You can see that the gradient is essentially horizontal. Uh, so far there is no other way to explain this finding unless you invoke an IMF uh, radial. Uh, variation. I think this plot here is the most clear so far, uh, providing, let's say, compelling evidence for IMF radial gradients, at least in some massive elliptic galaxies. And we went a bit farther because uh, actually we can explore other features as well. This is the IMF slope radial tra radius trend. This is for bimodal and, yes, and unimodal models from the optical features in red. Okay? So, as I said before, these bimodal and unimodal models uh, have a fundamental difference in the, their prediction in terms of mass-to-light ratio. So, distinguishing between them is crucial if you want to constrain the mass-to-light ratio properly. So, the fraction of very low mass stars in uh, your IMF. And this is what we did by combining these constraints with those coming from the wings for band at one mi a micron. This, is a, this feature is a very special one because it's really sensitive to very, very low mass stars in the IMF. And what we saw here is that the constraints coming from wings for band are consistent with the bimodal, but they are inconsistent in the center with a unimodal distribution. So we went a significant step forward here in the sense that we are, we are also able to rule out single power law models as possible. Uh, explanation of IMF variations. So we have an enhanced fraction of low mass stars, 
but not such low mass stars in the central region of massive galaxies. Okay, we also did some comparison with dynamical models with Michele Cappellari, who was also in the paper, actually he estimated the, the mass to light ratio excess parameter, which is the mass to light ratio from dynamics normalized to that you would expect for a krupa like IMF, uh, which is the blue rectangle here at about half of the effective radius. This is what we get from spectroscopy, and as you can see, dynamics and spectroscopy are essentially providing a very consistent picture where dynamics gives a higher total mass light ratio as it should be. And there is also space for uh, some fraction of dark matter, which is around 14%, uh, which is more or less what you would actually expect in these central regions of galaxies. So you get consistent finding, uh, consistent uh, constraints from, from different techniques, which is extremely encouraging. Okay, this is uh, another paper we had actually from last year. Uh, to illustrate further, you know, the, the power of having this extruded like, data. There are four prominent sodium absorption features in the spectra of nearby early type galaxies. I don't know if you hear about that. There is a sodium D in the optical 5900 angstrom. Most people are familiar, or some, at least some people I think are familiar with it. Then you have the sodium 8200 feature, and then you have sodium J band and sodium K band. If you look at the literature, you will see that it has, been, it has been impossible for more than two decades to describe these absorption features in the spectra of early type galaxies in the sense that they are too strong with any possible uh, simple uh, stellar population model predictions. And people have actually struggled you know, to, to understand why this actually happens. So we developed with Alexander a, a set of uh, dedicated stellar population models with varying sodium abundance ratio, sodium or phi, uh, and also age, metallicity, and IMF. And we try to analyze all these four features simultaneously for the first time ever, I think, uh, with these new sets of models. And we got this kind of plot, very messy as well, but I mean, let me try to focus the attention on this, on this thing here. So these are the four. Uh, for, uh, sodium features as a function of metallicity, okay? Observation, the observation you should look at are those filled circles from the center to the other part of our G1, the first galaxy we observe with X shooter, okay? You have this one for sodium D, this is a trend for sodium uh, J band, and so on and so far. And the green symbols are the best fitting models of that we obtain from our approach with this new set of stellar population models. And then you, and, uh, varying uh, all possible parameters, which are age, metallicity, sodium or phi, uh, and also the IMF. So, and as you can see, amazingly enough, you can match all the observation extremely well for all the four features simultaneously. And in order to do that, you require your IMF to vary radially again, uh, in a way which is essentially consistent with the other constraints that I was showing you before but also high sodium or phi abundance ratios, up to 0.7 dex. The interesting finding here is that uh, the IMF, having a more bottom-heavy IMF, makes also the impact of sodium or phi higher. So you actually require both things in order to get such a high line strength of sodium features as you actually observe in early type galaxies. <coughs> this is possibly also one reason why you know, most studies failed before to, to match these features. Okay, two last slides and then I will summarize. You know, this is the ongoing thing, what I'm doing right now. Okay, so uh, we are actually working for the, for the whole sample of seven galaxies, extending the approach of our previous papers. And this, to make it shorter, you know, this is the kind of result that we get in terms of IMF variation as a function of radius in kiloparsec for the seven galaxies. This is a G1, the galaxies that I have been showing you so far. And the other colored curves are the other galaxies that you can see here. Essentially, we find IMF radial gradients in all of them, although in some cases they are shallower, but we de detect this kind of variation for all these uh, systems. This is in terms of mass to light ratio, where you have, once again, an answered mass to light ratio in, a, in the center, even more than a factor of two above the Krupa-like mass to light ratio expectation, and then it goes down to one when you move outwards. 
Okay, so this IMF radial gradient seems to be ubiquitous, at least in this very uh, high mass sample, small sample actually of early type galaxies. Okay, we're going a step farther here. I was mentioning before the comparison of to total mass to light ratio estimates with, uh, with Michele Capellari using the GEM technique. And uh, here we are also playing with the Schwarzschild models. Uh, this is a work that we are doing in collaboration with people at the MPIA. Essentially, we are plugging in the constraints, the mass to light ratio constraints as a function of radius in our sample of galaxies into their Schwarzschild, uh, Schwarzschild models uh, code. Okay, so we are trying, plugging this constraint inside the code, we are trying to fit simultaneously the kinematics along different position angles, the photometry through the multi Gaussian expansion of the, uh, the Sloan images. And when plugging the constraint from spectroscopy in terms of mass light ratio, we are also allowing for a uh, normalization factor, a rescaling factor. So essentially we are putting a constraint inside the code, but we are saying that maybe our mass to light ratio are uh, uh, not the final answer, and they could be rescaled with a given factor that we call f. This, and these are the, the parameters of the modeling. So you have the geometry of the system, the, the mass of black hole, the total mass of the system, and this normalization factor for the mass to light ratio profile coming from spectroscopy. And these are the results for our G1 galaxies. Uh, the observed kinematics is in uh, different colors with error bars. You can see the best fitting Schwarzschild models in uh, solid lines. You can see you fit pretty much well uh, the sigma and also rotation velocity profile. It is not shown here, but we are also plugging in the H3, H4 uh, profile from kinematics. And this is the best fitting rescaling factor that we get from the code. Okay? In principle, our mass to light ratios might be wrong, and then you would require a rescaling factor much different uh, than one. But this is actually what we get for the five galaxies that uh, uh, Zoo has analyzed so far. This is a one, and we get pretty much consistent with one. So the Schwarzschild models really like you know, a lot the mass to light ratio profiles that we are getting from spectroscopy. We don't need any rescaling whatsoever. Okay, so uh, I summarize, you know, the more or less some take-home messages in, uh, in this slide here. So, I, as I was showing, we started from a significant trend of IMF slope to increase with velocity dispersion, so with galaxy mass for the whole population of early type galaxies in Sloan. Metallicity seems to be actually the main correlator with these IMF variations in galaxies so far, but we are, of course, working to understand the issue better. Uh, we have detected IMF radial gradients in massive, very massive galaxies, while on the other mass side, let's say for low mass systems, we don't see much radial variation and everything seems to be uh, pretty much consistent with either a Krupa-like or a top-heavy distribution. No dependence on the environment where galaxies reside, so this IMF stuff seems to be really an intrinsic properties of the galaxies. And finally, with X shooter, we're going a step farther and we are also trying to uh, distinguish different IMF shapes and it seems that the IMF requires a bottom heavy variation but not such a strong variation at very low uh, mass range. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I, I thought I was in time, so I'm very happy about that. Mark. I have the impression from the way you chose your sample from the Sloan with FragDev smaller than 0.8, larger than 0.8, sorry is that you may have a, a population of lenticular galaxies, not only ellipticals. Mm -hmm. And um, 
this may have a different history in terms of dynamics and star formation. So I'm wondering how this impacts the results. And also from the, the seven galaxies that you yes. observe with the shooter, did you make sure they are supported by dispersion and there is no rotation or you don't care, it has no impact? Yeah. So about the first question, uh, well, what we did was also to, I mean, we did a static fitting for all the Sloan galaxies and we removed all of them showing some kind of a signature of a deviation from the static profile in the very inner region. This is the first thing, first check that we did in the Sloan paper and actually doing this uh, selection didn't change much the, the result. In the other paper about the environment, we also cross-matched the sample with the, the Galaxy Zoo catalog in order to try to remove all possible, let's say, uh, galaxies with a prominent bulge but not truly early type galaxies in the sample. And even in this case, uh, we didn't find much of a variation of the trend with velocity dispersion. And in any case, I have to say, both all these kind of selections mostly affect the, the low mass range between let's say 100 and 150 kilometers per second where you essentially observe a plateau in the trend. Okay, so we really think that the trend is robust in terms of this kind of selection for the sample. About the second question, so the only galaxy that has, uh, we have kinematics of course along different position angles so we could verify you know, how, which kind of uh, system we're talking about. Uh, there is only one system for which the rotation curve along one axis goes up to 70 km per second rotation. But in all the other six galaxies you get at most something around 30 compared to a velocity dispersion of 260 at the minimum. So, yeah. so I have a, just a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> I'm a bit um, puzzled by the lack of dependence with environment because if you assume that, as you said, these IMF gradients are, some, are somehow related to the accretion history of the galaxy, I would expect that the accretions of centers and satellites are different, so I would expect at least some kind of trend that you don't see. So well, uh, to, be, uh, to be complete, you know, in the sentence, I should say that there is no dependence on the environment for the galaxy central regions. I mean, when you look at the IMF constraints that you get, let's say, within half of the effective radius, you don't see much variation on, uh, with the environment. Okay, so this doesn't that mean in general that, for instance, the profiles do not depend on the environment. So you said you need to go at larger radii to see something. Yeah, if there is a difference in the accretion history, you would probably expect to see an effect mostly in the outer part, or at least, let's say, uh, outside the very core region of the galaxy. Okay. I think it's quite reasonable. Okay. And just my uh, last question is, so assuming now that these IMF gradients are uh, true and they are all in all galaxies, what happens with all stellar masses that we derive from uh, photometry, broadband photometry, uh, in using a fixed IMF? Uh, does it impact somehow the mass functions that we know from? from yes, it does. It, does. it changes so the, 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 the mass function in the sense that the mass function would be even more extended you know, to higher masses. There are a couple of papers, I think, addressing this issue in particular. So, uh, I mean, in the very central region, the mass inferred from photometry would be wrong by factor of two. But of course, if you take a region inside, let's say, one effective radius, because of the gradients, the effect would be lower, possibly by a factor of 1.4, something like this. So, which would mean that essentially for the most massive galaxies, the masses estimated with a Krupa-like distribution are 40% uh, lower than those you infer correctly let's assume correctly by using a variant IMF. So uh, great work Francesco, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Um, so what does this mean theoretically? So one could use uh, um, genes mass uh, arguments to say that uh, when the metallicity is high you cool faster and you decrease your genes mass and so if you decrease your genes mass you don't form massive stars. But that doesn't really tell you what the slope is. It just tells you what the cutoff is at the far end. But for elliptical galaxies it's relevant because they're old. Then there's, a, then there's been work by uh, Enbel and Chabrier mm -hmm. who've used press checker arguments. Um, so I was wondering whether, whether you have thought about how your results 
which show that metallicity is the main driver, uh, connect with uh, theoretical arguments? Well, uh, I don't know if there is a truly, you know, theoretical connection in the sense that, uh, you know, what you observe is a correlation with metallicity, but of course you have a number of parameters changing with metallicity as well. Mm -hmm. So besides that, I mean, the mass scale is also affected by pressure. So it's true metallicity gets higher, but also pressure changes. So it's not so trivial, you know, to conclude that actually the mass scale should change with, uh, with the metallicity, uh, while observationally you actually see this kind of correlation in place. So um, the answer, I don't have an answer in the sense that we are working, I mean, to, to really understand, first of all, if metallicity is the true driver, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. physical driver, let's mm -hmm. say, of the variations. And then I think probably, you know, going after the theory would be a step forward, I okay. guess. Okay, it's a very pleasant talk because it's clarifying the traces of IMS. But at the beginning you showed, and it's all right, the influence of the star formation rate. And when you compare the center and the disk by saying it is a bot, uh, bottom AV, IMF, or Coupa, in fact, you implicitly admit that the star formation rate is the same in the two cases. And it is clear for sigma from sigma itself that the star formation rate is completely different in the center and in the disk. So could you comment about that? Well, in our analysis, we take into account the star formation, uh, possible, star, possible variations in the star formation of, of galaxies at different positions, for instance, because we allow, you know, for one SSP, two SSP, extended star formation, and so on and so far. And what I can say is that so far, I mean, for whatever kind of implementation that we have done in this sense, we always recover quite robust results in terms of gradients, for instance, in galaxies. So... If you want that with a star formation rate, you find exactly the same result, but saying it's a f an effect of the star formation rate, not an IMF, which is a priori constant. Maybe we are wrong, but in fact, uh, IMF is not changing from the center to the external part. It's another point of view. But you have to demonstrate uh, that our point of view is not the good one. Uh, yeah, no, the point is that there is no way you can change your star formation rate if you want your star formation history uh, and match at the same time the gravity sensitive features. Because, for instance, there are some of them, especially in near infrared, they are completely insensitive to the age parameter. I propose you, sh you oh, should discuss that uh, offline. <laughs> Any more questions for Francesco? Okay. Yes. So j just one quick question. The, the IMF slope you showed as function of radius, it's the projected radius, right? Yes. Okay, so the in deprojected in, in 3D will be uh, even... Even stronger, yes. Stronger even dependency, right? Trim. Okay. Last question? No? Well, let's f thank Francesco again. Sorry.